Code Switch tackles race and identity frankly and without fear. It's a podcast from NPR that makes all of us part of the conversation because we're all a part of the story. Find Code Switch wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is reporter Laura Starcheski. Reveal provides independent journalism. We're a nonprofit newsroom supported by listeners like you. Become a member and we'll send you a Reveal face mask with the word facts embroidered on it as a special thank you gift. From the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Edson. We're picking up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, with Chapter 6 of American Rehab, The White Vans. We left off last time with the story of how mass incarceration helped build a prison-to-rehab pipeline through the 1980s and 90s. A steady supply of participants getting court-ordered to attend Senecor and work, but not get paid. Our reporter, Shoshana Walter, asked for a tour of the Senecor program, but Senecor said no. They didn't want to show us what kind of work participants are doing. They didn't even want us to meet any current participants in the program. But we knew that Senecor workers were scattered all over Baton Rouge, at warehouses and kitchens on construction sites, alongside regular workers. And the Senecor workers were not getting paid. So in March of 2019, Laura Starcheski and I decided to head out into Baton Rouge to find them. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, Great. twelve. Perfect, you're good. All right, so let's try, where do you want to try first? Tony Seafood, maybe? I have a couple sources yeah. inside Senecor who leaked documents yeah. to me and door. told me about businesses that use Senecor um, workers. So we've got a list of recent job sites. It's a spreadsheet of a bunch of businesses in town where Senecor participants go up to 80 hours a week for what Senecor calls work therapy. Alligator meat, frogs legs, turtle meat, crawfish pies. Which means their treatment could be selling live catfish and turtle meat here at Tony Seafood. Hi. Hello. We were, we're just doing a story on the Senecor Foundation. We heard that they worked here. Who? The Senecor Foundation? No, they used to. Oh, they used they to. They have been here. Um... Next door, there's a big factory, Louisiana Fish Fry. We'd heard Senecor sent people there, too. Louisiana Fish Fry. There's people taking breaks. Inside the Louisiana Fish Fry building, they make huge quantities of Cajun seasoning. We walk up to one of the workers in the parking lot. Like, how often do folks from Senecor work here? Uh, I'm not really sure, because uh, everybody wear the same uniform, so, you know, you kind of really can't tell one from another. So the main sure. difference is invisible. The Senecor workers aren't making any money. On the east side of town, across the street from a Waffle House, they work at a business that's just called Notico on the spreadsheet. We have no idea what this place is. It looks like a big warehouse with a giant doorway open on the side. There are a few workers standing around. I grab my headphones, recorder, and big fuzzy microphone. We hop out of the car and go over. Hey, you guys. We're reporters. We're doing a story on Senecor. And we heard that Senecor workers work here, and we were just yeah, wondering. Yeah, they, they, they're in the back. Oh, they're in the back? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what Come is... on, let's go. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll... This was an older guy, but maybe the fastest walker I've ever seen. We follow him into the warehouse. These giant fans are whirring high up overhead. It's a lighting and electrical supply company. Industrial shelves crammed full of supplies go almost all the way up to the ceiling and our fast walker passes the baton to Fred. Hi. Hi. It's Shoshana. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. This is Laura. Thank you so much. How you doing? Good. Good. What can I do for you? We're reporters with Reveal. We're working on a story about Senecor, and we heard that, ooh, sorry, Senecor workers were working Working here, here. and we just wanted to know more about it. Oh, okay. Well, actually, uh... Fred gestures to two men behind him. They're wearing neon orange T-shirts. They're standing about 20 feet away. These are two Senecor workers. We wave to each other. I can't quite see what they're doing. We make eye contact, but we're not close enough to give them our names. And in this moment, 
I have this self-aggrandizing fantasy that they'll see all my recording equipment and piece it together. We're journalists. We want to tell the world who they are and whatever's happening to them. They'll find some way to get a message to us. Well, actually, uh, Joey, my supervisor, is who you need to speak to. Oh, okay. Let me go. Let me go bring you up sure. there. Sure. Sure. Uh, Hi. Actually, one of the um, he's part of the family. This, this is Nota Co, and he's a Nota. Oh, really? Fred steers us in the exact opposite direction from the two workers. We have to talk to the boss, he says. We follow him through a door into a front office full of cubicles. They're doing, a, they're doing, a, they're reporters, they're doing an article on Center Court, and how are you? An older white guy, lean and neatly dressed, strides up to us. Light blue jeans, short sleeve shirt. He crosses his arms. I'm the lawyer. Oh, very good. So, You're the right person. I'm the right person to say no. Yeah, we don't. Would if you if you were or someone were to ask the guys who are here if they no, are no, interested? No, no, they don't have the authority. It's Senecor that would have to get permission. To, and for them those to guys talk. would have to as well. But okay, no, we don't we don't do that. We, you know, it's a, it's a it's a privacy issue, and we honor people's privacy. Yeah, that's I understand. Yeah, and that would be really for any of our employees. We would we just don't do it. Well, maybe We didn't want to violate anyone's privacy. We tried to ask more questions, but the lawyer said he was going to call the sheriff if we didn't get out. So we got out. We even reached back out to them later, and the company wouldn't comment. We still wanted to hear from Senecor workers themselves to give them a chance to tell us if they loved the program, if they hated it. We needed to hear it from them. So the next morning, we wake up before dawn with a new plan. All right. It's only nine minutes away. Great. So I think you should... We go to Senecor's residential treatment facility where the workers live. Like, what do we do when we get to Senecor? Like, how close do we park? I don't know. I don't know. It's early, about 5.30 in the morning. Shows clutching a huge coffee cup. We're the only car around. And we park down the block. So, like, park down here facing that way? Exactly. That's a good idea. Every morning before 6 a.m., unmarked white passenger vans full of rehab participants pull out of the Senecor parking lot. The vans go to job sites all over Baton Rouge. We're going to follow a van, see where it goes, and try to talk to the people inside. So we wait. <sighs> Ten minutes go by. Is there another entrance and exit? I don't think so. 20. There's a van. One of the big white passenger vans pulls out of the Senecor parking lot. It has no Senecor logo on the side, no markings of any kind. It just says vehicle number 20 on the back. And we can't see inside. We start following it. Why are there two cars all of a sudden in between us and the van? We're immediately paranoid that they know our plan and are trying to stop it. There were no cars a minute ago. Why did that happen? Yeah, that's weird. The van pulls onto the highway. Are they getting off at the next exit? I can't. I can't see. A couple more cars pull between us and them. And we lose the van. Are they still in the right lane? I don't know. All we can do is try to see if they're still on here, because if they got off, then we're kind of screwed. This is the point where Sho jams the gas pedal to the floor and passes a whole line of cars. Oh my God, you're amazing! Yes! <laughs> wow. The van exits the highway. We're twisting and turning through residential neighborhoods. Then it gets more rural. It's still dark out. I wonder where we're going. They make a turn, we make a turn. Then all of a sudden, the van pulls over on the grass next to a chain link fence. We can see now that it's mostly empty. There's just a driver and a passenger. Okay. Well, what do I do? Just pull up, I think, and try to talk to oh, him. Yeah. Here, we'll do. Hi. How are y'all doing? How you doing? Good. How are you? All right. We're we're reporters with Reveal, and we were just wondering where you guys are going, what you're what you're up to. What's that? We're, we're reporters with Reveal. We were just hoping to talk to you about Senecor and what you guys are up to. <laughs> oh. Oh. We're doing 
going good. Uh, I don't know exactly what else to say. Honestly, off record. That's all we can share with you from our very brief exchange. These guys did not want to go on the record. We would learn later that Senegor had told everyone in the program they should not talk to us. Right. Y'all have a good morning. Okay, thanks. You too. Okay. We pull around to see what this place actually is. It looks oh, like a high already? school. Glen Oaks Magnet High School. It's definitely under construction. It's a public school with a huge construction site next to it. Looks like they're building a new school building. If Seneca workers are at this site, people must know about it. So we go inside and talk to the principal. We don't have anybody in Seneca here. Really? No. Where do you get that information? Who clearly thinks we're very confused. Well, we're, but he puts us on the phone with one of the construction project managers anyway. See, I'm trying to direct you to the correct person here. He tells us we need to talk to Cliff. Oh my God, it's daylight out already. <laughs> That's Cliff right there. He's coming this way. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you so Thank you so no much. No it's nice care. to meet you. Cliff is the first person who seems to know what we're talking about. I think the electricians have a couple of people. Oh, okay. I think they do. Yeah. And he points to a guy walking towards us oh, across okay. the site, the electrical foreman for a company called AEC. Oh, one of the okay. businesses on my leaked spreadsheet. What's his name? Cliff. Cliff. Oh, that's it's Cliff over there. <laughs> Cliff yes. and Cliff? Yeah, that is very confusing. The sun's beaming off the big metal machinery. We're standing next to this construction site. Kids are starting to arrive for school. Workers are racing around, trucks and equipment grinding away. A muscular guy with a reddish beard in a hoodie and a white hard hat strides up to us. Hi, good morning. Cliff number two. Cliff Smith. He gives me an elbow bump. Laura. Hey, Laura, hey. man, my hands okay. are nasty. I'm right. sorry. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, y'all too. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting your work. No worries. No we, worries. We were just wondering to learn. We were hoping to learn more about the Senate Corps workers and how you know what they do here and what it's okay. like to have them here. Uh, yeah, they're uh, they're a good addition to what we do here. So it's like, Cliff tells uh, us yeah. that yes, he has two Senate Corps guys working for him. Uh, so we have two on hand right now. So the guys in the yeah. van are here. Did they come to you knowing how to do electrical work? Some do, some don't. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of train them on site. On it's a normal conversation, which is surreal. Why is this such a carefully sure. guarded yeah. secret? Yeah. Right. How did you first learn about the Senate Corps Foundation? Like, what was your first interaction like with a Senate Corps worker? Um, it just through my trade, through my trade. And it's just a slow process. It was just a slow, slow process learning about it. So A slow process of learning about it. Cliff is being a little vague. We keep asking about his relationship with Senecor. He's friendly, but there's something he's not telling us. Finally, he busts out with this. I'm actually a Senecor graduate. But, yeah. Really? He's a Senecor graduate. You didn't tell us that. I, I, know. I, I just don't <laughs> like because it's, you know, that's a tough thing to admit that I did so much crappy things throughout my life. But, you know, so now I'm here. When people meet me nowadays, they're like, wait, really? So it's like, you know, yeah. When were you in the program? Uh, it's been about five years. Wow. Yeah. Is that how you learn electrical work? Yeah, that's how okay. I learned the trade. Okay. It's an emotional thing for me when I, you know, so it's like, because I've come from so low. He tells us he was addicted to opioids, in and out of jail. He was court-ordered to Senecor, and it took him three tries to make it through. He says Senecor forces people to learn how to stop sucking the life out of society. They need to be forced to learn to work, and that's a good thing. Not only am I a better person, but my, my family, my parents, my daughters, my, everybody that sees me, everybody that's around me, it's like huge, it's huge. It's crazy how one person can make so much of a difference. And even if a small percentage of people that go through Senecor can actually pull off what I'm, I'm working to pull off, uh, man, even if that small percentage can do it, that's, man, that's huge. It's huge. Even if it is so just a, a small thing. percentage, so, yeah. 
This all sounds miraculous. AEC, the company Cliff works for, they told us they treated Senecor like any staffing service. They've even hired a few other Senecor graduates. Cliff's standing in the sunshine. He looks totally recovered. He's singing the praises of this program, and we say our goodbyes. And then, that same day, our phones start ringing. This is Laura. Remember my self-aggrandizing fantasy? Well, one of the guys in the Notico Lighting Warehouse, he did piece together who we were. Somehow, he figured out we were from Reveal, he found my number, and got the word around. Oh, hey, Robert, how are you? He got word to people like Robert Hartman, who told me he'd just fled Senecor a few weeks before. Um, okay, D- do you mind if I just record this call real quick? This is what we're doing is a radio story. Okay, hang on just one second. Okay, go on ahead. Sorry about that. It's, it's, it's a money making. I mean, I give them hats, you know, hats off to them on, on their hustle because it's, they're making money hand over fist, you know, it's just, but it's, you know, what cost, you know. What, what kind of jobs did you do when you were in there? Uh, scaffold built. Um, I did in the plants. I built scaffold. Uh, for, did for electrical who, what work. Plants? Do you remember? <laughs> uh, total PCS nitrogen. PCS uh, nitrogen is a fertilizer company. Nutrien, their parent company, said they weren't aware of unpaid workers on their site. And the other company Robert mentioned, Total, is a global oil and gas corporation. They never got back to me. Robert told me Senecor also sent him to work at a tree trimming company. They had him work as a mover. He worked a full-time job during the week and did odd jobs on the weekends. You're working, I mean, six, seven days a week. You know, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. He also said he'd done electrical work. Who'd you do electrical for? Um, AEC. Oh, okay, for AEC. Yes, ma'am. What kind of sites did you work at for that? Um, a high school. I did the Glen Oaks High School. The school district told us they expect subcontractors to follow safety and labor laws. Oh, um, we were there this morning. Were you? Yeah, we yeah, were at the Glen Oaks that, High School this yeah, morning. We talked was, to um, Cliff. Was he your supervisor? Yeah, yeah, Cliff was. How was that? Um, you know, I, Cliff's a good guy. I, you know, I... Um, Robert liked Cliff, really said Cliff was always good to him. That wasn't the problem. The problem was feeling beat down and brainwashed by Senecor, the back-breaking work he did at the chemical plants, the way he felt dehumanized. But you're in Senecor, so it's kind of like, you know, an unspoken agreement that you're going to get the crappy job and, you know, you're not... They don't care, just get it done, you know? Once more people heard what we were doing, we got more messages. Some people were too scared to be recorded or identified. One man told me the program was so difficult, he had lost his faith in God while he was there. Fifteen Senecor guys, all working at the same plant, got a message to us through their supervisor. She said their message was simple. They were tired. They were so, so tired. Which left us determined to find out, if Senecor is supposed to be a drug rehab, is anything resembling treatment actually happening inside? We tracked down Senecor participants to tell us about the treatment they got. And as soon as I walked in, there were some people there just yelling at each other telling people to go sit and time out. And I was like, what is this? They're allowed to get in your face and scream at you, in your face and scream at you. And they're like, who do you think you are coming here and trying to tempt us? In my face, guys yelling at me like this. And what happened to them on the job? I felt something pop, I heard it pop. And then pain, just throbbing, holy shit. My arm's about to fall off pain. We start to find out exactly how valuable these participants are to Senecor. You're getting paid three packs of $3 a pack cigarettes a week. I wonder how much money you made for them while you were there. Oh, God. Thousands, tens of thousands. That's next time on American Rehab.
The American Rehab Reporting Team is Shoshana Walter, Laura Starczewski, and Ike Shreese Kandaraja. Brett Myers is our editor. Laura is our lead producer and produced this chapter. Amy Julia Harris helped us report the story from the beginning and launch the project. We had additional editorial support from Narda Zucchino, Andy Donahue, and Esther Kaplan. And production help from WHYY in Philadelphia. Fact-checking by Rosemarie Ho. Victoria Baronetsky is our general counsel. Our production manager is Mwende Inahosa. Our production team includes Najib Amini, Amy Mustafa, and Claire Mullen. Our theme song is Lifeline by the dynamic duo Jay Breezy, Mr. Jim Briggs, and Fernando, my man, Yo Aruda. They composed and performed all of the music on American Rehab. Our CEO is Krista Scharfenberg. Matt Thompson is our editor-in-chief. And our executive producer is Kevin Sullivan. Support for Reveals provided by the Reva and David Logan Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, the Democracy Fund, and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Ledson, and remember, there is always more to the story. <laughs>